Welcome to section 14 of Cardiac Pathology. In this section, we'll be discussing shock. Let's get started. Shock is a critical state of insufficient organ perfusion. It is a life-threatening condition and needs to be managed promptly. Here's an overview slide of the information we'll be discussing. Let's begin by discussing the stages of shock. Shock can be divided into three stages, initial or compensatory, progressive, and irreversible. The first stage is the compensated initial stage where the body tries to compensate for diminished tissue perfusion. Examples of compensation include tachycardia and peripheral vasoconstriction, which helps maintain cardiac output and blood pressure. Another thing to keep in mind is that hyperlactatemia can serve as an early sign of shock. This is because of lactic acid production due to tissue hypoxia. In other words, the tissues are starved for oxygen and start to utilize anaerobic metabolism producing lactic acid. As the patient progresses through the stages of shock, this oxygen starvation gets progressively worse and lactic acid levels become higher and higher. But since lactic acid is produced pretty early on in shock, it's a useful clinical sign to look at to catch it in the initial stage. The next stage of shock is the progressive stage. In this stage, compensatory mechanisms fail and aggressive interventions are needed to prevent the patient from developing multiple organ failure. If interventions fail to improve the patient's condition, the patient may progress to the last stage of shock, the irreversible stage. In this stage, the persistent decreased organ perfusion leads to a widespread shift from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. In this stage, there's profound hypotension, hypoxemia, and organ failure. And recovery is unlikely and is accompanied by a very poor prognosis. All right, now let's discuss the four types of shock. Variations in this image will be used quite a bit to illustrate and differentiate between the different types of shock. One thing to keep in mind is that the average person's normal blood volume is approximately 5 liters, as we've shown here. Also note that in the coming images, the pathology that we'll focus on will be shown in gray in the image. So this is the normal reference image. Here is a table summing up the most important features of the four types of shock. The first type we're going to discuss is cardiogenic shock. In cardiogenic shock, there's an intracardiac cause that leads to pump failure. We can essentially subdivide cardiogenic shock into left ventricular and right ventricular dysfunction. In this slide, we're going to discuss left ventricular dysfunction. Again, we've shaded the pathology in gray right here. Causes include myocardial infarction, heart failure, or arrhythmia. In left ventricular dysfunction, the pump failure results in decreased stroke volume, which causes decreased cardiac output. Let's think back to the equation for cardiac output, which is cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. The way the body tries to increase cardiac output when stroke volume is low is by increasing the heart rate. And how does the body do this? By activating the sympathetic nervous system. The activation of the sympathetic nervous system results in an increased heart rate, cardiac contractility, and salt and fluid retention via the kidneys. This increases the systemic vascular resistance, which we've shown here and it also increases the left ventricular preload. This increase in left ventricular preload, coupled with failure of the pump function on the left side of the heart, yields an increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and backup of fluid into the lungs, resulting in pulmonary edema, as we've shown here. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is an indirect measure of the left atrial pressure and therefore provides information about the left ventricular preload. It's measured by inserting a catheter with a balloon into the pulmonary circulation and then inflating the balloon, like this, and measuring the pressure there. Because the pulmonary circuit is a low-pressure system and the left atrium is where it empties, this is an acceptable surrogate for left atrial pressure. So looking at this table again, we're focusing on left ventricular dysfunction. As we discussed in the previous slide, we have significantly decreased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, and increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And again, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is due to pulmonary edema and left ventricular dysfunction. Okay, let's cover the rest of the features for cardiogenic shock after we discuss right ventricular dysfunction, since the remaining features are the same. So here's a similar image demonstrating right ventricular dysfunction. This can be a result of a right ventricular MI or heart failure. Similarly, in right ventricular dysfunction, there's failure to pump blood into the pulmonary arteries, causing decreased cardiac output and sympathetic activation. So right ventricular dysfunction leads to decreased cardiac output. 
Both left ventricular and right ventricular dysfunction have very similar consequences. The only difference is in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. As we previously discussed, in left ventricular dysfunction, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is increased. However, it's decreased in right ventricular dysfunction. In right ventricular dysfunction, the pump failure causes an increased pressure in the right atrium. The increase in right atrial pressure doesn't allow a lot of blood to enter the heart. Or in other words, the preload is decreased. If there's not a lot of blood entering the right side of the heart, there won't be much going to the left side of the heart either. Therefore, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is decreased. Coming back to this table, now let's focus on right ventricular dysfunction. So as you can see, in both left ventricular and right ventricular dysfunction, there will be a decrease in cardiac output and an increase in systemic vascular resistance. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be increased in left ventricular dysfunction and decreased in right ventricular dysfunction. Let's quickly talk about the skin's appearance in cardiogenic shock. The pump failure leads to decreased perfusion of the periphery. This leads to the extremities being pale and cold because of the lack of blood flow. The extremities are also clammy or sweaty, and this is due to the sympathetic nervous system exciting apocrine glands. In cardiogenic shock, treatment with ionotropes is important because they help the pumping function of the heart. Treatment with diuretics also helps by removing fluid and thus reducing pulmonary edema. Take a quick look at the treatments for the other types of shock. And note that diuretics are specific to cardiogenic shock. This is an important fact because in some of the other types of shock, the opposite treatment, or providing fluid, is indicated. However, giving fluid to a person in cardiogenic shock is contraindicated because it will worsen their pulmonary edema and negatively impact their ability to breathe. Okay, the next type of shock we'll discuss is obstructive. This is very similar to cardiogenic shock, but it's due to extra cardiac causes and is often associated with poor right ventricular output. We can further divide obstructive shock into pulmonary vascular causes and mechanical causes. Examples of pulmonary vascular obstructive shock are pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension. Examples of mechanical obstructive shock are tension pneumothorax and pericardial tamponade. This slide outlines the pathophysiology of obstructive shock specifically due to tension pneumothorax. As we already mentioned, obstructive shock occurs due to pulmonary vascular causes or mechanical causes. In both cases, the mechanical obstruction prevents the heart from pumping blood, decreasing the cardiac output. This in turn causes activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which increases heart rate and systemic vascular resistance. So as we've stated here, there is increased systemic vascular resistance. In the mechanical type of obstructive shock, the primary physiological disturbance is decreased preload. For example, in a tension pneumothorax, the decreased preload is explained by compression of the venous return to the right side of the heart. The increased pleural pressure in tension pneumothorax also impedes blood flow into the pulmonary circulation. So as we stated here, there is obstruction of the pulmonic circulation. This causes backup of blood into the heart, which further reduces preload. Similarly, in cardiac tamponade, the increased pressure around the heart prevents blood from entering it. As we just mentioned, cardiac output will be decreased and systemic vascular resistance will be increased. Now let's talk about the others. In the case of pulmonary vascular causes, right ventricular failure occurs due to a hemodynamically significant pulmonary embolism or severe pulmonary hypertension. The pulmonary vascular resistance is so great in these instances that the heart is unable to generate enough pressure to overcome the obstruction. This increases the pressure in the right atrium and consequently decreases preload. This means there will be a decrease in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The only exception to this is cardiac tamponade. In this case, there will be an increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is because in tamponade, blood within the pericardial sac compresses the heart and causes increased pressure in all of the heart chambers including the left atrium. Again, in this type of shock, the extremities will be cold and clammy for the same reasons as in cardiogenic shock, which is due to decreased peripheral tissue perfusion. In obstructive shock, the treatment consists of relieving the obstruction, which allows the heart to pump blood. The next and most common type of shock we'll discuss is hypovolemic shock. We can divide hypovolemic shock into hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic, depending on the underlying cause. Hypovolemic shock refers to shock due to reduced intravascular volume. In our gray-shaded pathology, see that the blood volume reads about 4 liters. Recall that a circulating volume of about 5 liters is typical for an adult. So this represents a loss of one-fifth, or 20% of the blood volume. Hypovolemic shock can be divided into hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic causes. Hemorrhagic causes occur due to bleeding. 
Non-hemorrhagic causes, on the other hand, are due to fluid loss other than blood, such as in severe dehydration. In both cases, this leads to a decrease in total effective circulating blood volume, which means there's less filling of the heart, which decreases cardiac output. When there is decreased cardiac output, the same previously mentioned cascade occurs. The sympathetic response increases the heart rate and systemic vascular resistance. So from the table, notice that cardiac output is decreased and systemic vascular resistance is increased. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure decreases because the blood volume making it to the heart is very low. And since there isn't enough blood and not a lot is available to the periphery, the extremities are cold and clammy. Treatment revolves around volume replacement with IV fluids. It's also important to treat the underlying cause. For instance, if something is bleeding, you should stop the bleeding. The next and last type of shock we'll discuss is distributive shock. The unifying feature of the different types of distributive shock is profound vasodilation. Distributive shock, by definition, is caused by excessive vasodilation. Notice that in the image we've shown the systemic vascular quite dilated and gray right here. Septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic shock are all types of distributive shock. They all have unique features, but we'll spend most of the time on septic shock, as we've shown here, since this is the highest yield. Septic shock occurs due to pathogens causing the release of vasodilatory substances, such as nitric oxide and histamine. This results in a very low systemic vascular resistance. So as we've stated here, systemic vasodilation keeps blood from returning to the heart. Septic shock occurs most commonly with gram-positive organisms, but LPS-associated gram-negative organisms are an important etiology to know as well, and these are covered in our microbiology section. In contrast to anaphylactic and neurogenic shock, septic shock is characterized by an initial increase in cardiac output. This could possibly be due to the differences in time frame of each of these subtypes. With septic shock, the inflammatory mediators build up over time. The relatively slower process may result in gradual vasodilation. This would result in a low systemic vascular resistance while the preload is maintained. The drop in afterload on the heart would allow for an initial increase in cardiac output. This actually makes septic shock the black sheep of all of the types of shock. No other type of shock increases cardiac output. In neurogenic shock, which occurs due to trauma to the spine, there is a loss of sympathetic nervous stimulation. But not just that, there is also unopposed vagal stimulation, which leads to bradycardia. Bradycardia, hemodynamic instability, and massive vasodilation are the classic triad of neurogenic shock. Anaphylaxis is a severe systemic allergic reaction leading to hemodynamic instability. In this case, the decreased systemic vascular resistance is primarily due to massive histamine release. Recall that histamine is released from mast cells after activation by antigen-binding immunoglobulin E, as well as increased synthesis of prostaglandins. All right, with that in mind, let's finish discussing distributive shock. As mentioned earlier, in septic shock, cardiac output is increased. In the other types of distributive shock, cardiac output decreases. Again, in contrast to septic shock, anaphylactic and neurogenic shock are almost immediate, whereas septic shock likely takes more time. With anaphylactic and neurogenic shock, the sudden and massive peripheral vasodilation likely results in poor venous return to the heart, resulting in decreased preload and cardiac output. Systemic vascular resistance is reduced greatly in all the types of distributive shock. And this makes sense considering that in all three types of shock, there is increased vasodilation. Due to the profound vasodilation, venous return is decreased, which causes decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Because of the low vascular resistance, there is increased blood delivery to the periphery, which causes the extremities to be warm. In septic shock, the extremities are flushed due to the increased cardiac output. In anaphylactic shock, they are itchy. I like to remember this by thinking of all of that histamine that's being released, causing the body to be warm and itchy, similar to an allergic response. Finally, in neurogenic shock, because of the lack of sympathetic stimulation, the apocrine glands are not activated and the skin is dry. Finally, the treatment of distributive shock depends on the underlying cause, but mainly consists of giving IV fluids and vasopressors to restore blood pressure. All right, now that we've covered the main types of shock, Let's discuss the complications. These are caused by the profound systemic hypotension that diminishes the blood supply and causes inadequate perfusion to the organs. The result is tissue hypoxia and the inability to meet the metabolic demands of the tissues. And finally, dysfunction of vital organs. The brain 
is the most susceptible organ to hypoxia. The result is neuron cell death in the areas most vulnerable to hypoxia. These are regions with high metabolic demand. For example, the hippocampus and the cerebellar Purkinje cells. Also, areas supplied by the distalmost branches of the cerebral arteries, called watershed areas, are particularly susceptible. Other areas that could be affected are bilateral cerebral convexities. The sustained generalized cerebral hypoperfusion during hypotension and shock results in global cerebral ischemia and cell death and necrosis in both cerebral convexities. Other areas also first to be affected are the splenic flexure and the rectosigmoid junction. Both areas are supplied by distal branches of two different arteries, making them watershed zones. So in questions, be sure to look for a patient with signs of shock and hypotension with damage to any of these regions to clue you into the diagnosis. All right, now that we've covered the information, let's review with the question. An 85-year-old man is brought to the emergency department from his nursing home with altered mental status. According to his nurse, he has been disoriented and belligerent for the past two days. During this time, he has had diarrhea, loss of appetite, and increased frequency of urination with an unpleasant odor. His temperature is 37.6 degrees Celsius, blood pressure is 85 over 60, and pulse is 110 per minute. His extremities are warm and appear flushed. He has a weak pulse, but no other cardiac findings. Which of the following hemodynamic changes will be evident in this patient? A. Decreased cardiac output, decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. B. Decreased cardiac output, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. C. Increased cardiac output, decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. Or D. Increased cardiac output, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. Okay, hopefully from this question, you notice that this patient is suffering from distributive shock. More specifically, the patient has signs and symptoms of septic shock. He has an altered mental status, hypotension, and increased frequency of urination with an unpleasant odor, which is suggestive of a urinary tract infection. His extremities are also warm and appear flushed. With this in mind, the correct answer is C, increased cardiac output, decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. If we go back to our table, remember that septic shock occurs due to pathogens causing the release of vasodilatory substances, such as nitric oxide and histamine, and this results in a very low systemic vascular resistance. This is compensated by an increased heart rate to increase the cardiac output. In this type of shock, the increased blood delivery to the periphery causes the extremities to be warm. A is incorrect because in distributive septic shock, there is increased cardiac output due to the increase in heart rate. B is incorrect because in septic shock, the cardiac output is increased and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is decreased. D is incorrect because in septic shock, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is decreased. Recall that this is because of the profound vasodilation resulting in decreased venous return, which in turn decreases the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate for the preload. So D is incorrect. And again, the correct answer is C. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about shock.